So uh, today is March, April, March, April 5th. Um, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, this is the, uh, let me grab something here. Um, Town of Groton Golf Advisory Board meeting. All right, whoops, where are you? Sorry, let me just get my screens in order here so I can see people. All right, so first um, item on the agenda, boy, oh boy, this is what happens when is review of the, the minutes from the last meeting. If folks have had a chance to review the meeting minutes from the February 1st meeting. So I couldn't find an issue Cindy, any concerns with the meeting minutes? Yeah, I wasn't listed as present. I've been lurking at the last couple of meetings. So, so I didn't realize for sure that I actually attended. So I looked and read my report to the RTM and said, yep, I was there. OK. All right. So we'll, Gary, we'll add you. Thank you. Margaret, I didn't see anything. Okay. I'll move acceptance. I'll second. All those in favor of the minutes as amended? Aye. Aye. Opposed? This is really odd. It's just two of us. Um, I know. <laughs> Nobody opposed, uh, minutes accepted as amended. All right, next topic, citizens petitions and comments. Hearing none, we'll move on to new correspondence communications from board members. Hearing oh. none. Oops. You okay? I just flipped my glasses. <laughs> ah. All right. Hearing none, we'll move to the um, golf course report for February and March. Oh, shoot. So, Todd. Okay, so uh, you all have a copy of the March 2021 mm -hmm. report. Yes. Um, keep in mind, well, you can see down at the bottom in the summary that our fiscal year to date presently is beyond last year's by 158K but you also have to keep in mind that last year was a record year. Mm -hmm. Last fiscal year was a record year by Eric, I think, Mark, Eric, I think it was 140K, I think, beyond what we had done before. Yes. So we're just killing it. And uh, as of today, um, from from uh, the beginning of the year to today, we have 49 new wow. members, 49 new members, mm -hmm. not returning, new. So, I mean. In which categories, Todd? 
Um, um, Cindy, it's all across. Okay. Um, we have uh, quite a few juniors, but we're seeing a lot of the associate and associate plus. We're seeing um, regular adults. It's uh, seniors. We're seeing it right across the board. Super. Yeah. Oh, great. No, right. <clears throat> I mean, I, I, Eric and I were talking today, and never before had we ever, you know, had the discussion about, well, how many members is too many members? <laughs> You know, some some clubs, when they reach like the 350 mark, they start saying, well, uh, I think we're kind of reaching saturation as far as members go. Um, we've never had to have that conversation because I think it was um, it was in 98 that um, our previous high water mark was, I think it was 298. That was when the new golf course was open. The renovation had been completed and it was the first year and we had a lot of activity. Um, but this is just uh, just crazy. So I think, I think your first um, indicator is going to be people complaining that they can't get tee times. No, that's right. And, and when, when, uh, when members sign up, we stress to them, we stress to them that, that they have a benefit of a jump on the um, the public. Um, right. One week ahead, they can call the shop at four o'clock and they can get one hour jump. So mm -hmm. if they make, so we stress anytime a new member signs up, we stress to them that if they have an idea that they're going to be wanting to play a week from whatever day it is, that they're to get on the phone and call. They can always cancel a time if they want, if they need to cancel. But that is a huge benefit that they need to be using. Right, so, so, so I'll still say, if somebody has an intention of playing golf on weekend mornings and <laughs> they, they start calling at four o'clock and we get to a point where they can't get a time within a reasonable time frame when their desire to play is, that's when I think we have a problem. No, right. We're not there yet. Okay. We're not there yet. I mean, um, our members, our members are, are able to get in and and uh, and book their times, and we're not there yet. I, I agree with you, Margaret. Okay. It can go the other way too, where if the members take all the times and there's no time for the public then you'll start hearing it from that side too yep exactly so it's no but, but i mean historically i mean um, um saturday and sunday morning um uh, times before 11 o'clock are more than 90 percent um members so i mean that's just the way it is we very few outsiders because the members know to jump on the times and uh, even before we instituted last year, the uh, the ability of the member to um, to call an hour ahead, um, we still saw greater than ninety percent uh, member participation on greens on on um, tee times before eleven o'clock. Yeah, no, I think that's good. And, and the only thing, and I think um, Eric, you saw this too. Um, on Twitter about maybe a month ago when we had our first really nice week, when on a, especially on a Tuesday, it was gonna hit 60-ish. Uh, somebody posted on Twitter that they had tried to, to get a tea time at Shenny and it was completely sold out for the day. Um, I'm pretty sure you saw it too, Eric, because I think I saw it from your, your Twitter account. Um, yeah, I saw that. That was actually uh, Brad Klein, he's a golf writer. Yeah. So, so I, instead I, of Brad calling me, he just tried to go through the normal channels and got a lot shut out. Yep, exactly. So I think that's just the other thing that we can start to pay attention to is people who you know, like, you, you just, I mean, you can't get a time at Shenning, so they'll just give up and go someplace else, the public. So I think that goes to what you just said, Eric. So 
So it's interesting. It's going to be a, it's 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 an interesting problem to have. <laughs> That's a crazy. Yeah, right. I mean, the bottom line is that I mean, if our tea sheet is full then that's that's the good thing yeah. and it's like uh the yogi yogi Berra thing uh nobody goes to that restaurant because you know you can't get a you know you can't get a seat you can't get a reservation <laughs> so i mean well it's when you start auctioning off tea times that we know put them on ebay and, and people start paying 120 for a tea time at jenny then you're in business <laughs> that sounds like revenue diversity can, yeah can we <laughs> <laughs> Can we start auctioning them off <laughs> ourselves <Yeah. laughs> as an alias? <laughs> that would be good. Put it on StubHub. Yeah. Hey, I got a tea time at Shenny. Anybody want it? Huh. No, so it's it's good stuff. And and you're right. We just kind of need to pay attention to those balances and those things that we're hearing. Um, if we start hearing one way or the other, people either can't get it tea time when they'd like to play in their season pass holders or vice versa that the public is struggling to to get a tea time because i imagine you need that we we need that public uh greens fee in order mm -hmm. to support the um, income and the revenue here yeah all right what's the uh and eric and todd what's the the best method to keep a pulse on what people are saying is it Facebook? Is is that what we should be looking at, or what? Uh, you know, where do frustrated golfers go uh, when they can't get tee times besides par four? Um, we'll get the most just, complaints probably on Facebook. Facebook, okay. But then the guys in the pro shop are going to hear it too. You know, oh yes, those, those are going to be the really the, the pro shop will hear everything before it goes anywhere else i would think yeah but, but our, our our dedicated customers are getting in there and if you if you're going to call the day before a saturday and say yeah what do you have for nine o'clock in the morning no no these are people who are calling at four o'clock the week before we're only i mean we're only really talking about the people who call at four o'clock the week before no no well they're they're not aced out that that's that doesn't happen. Okay. They're they're getting in there. the The problem with the people that are 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 upset or complaining or what have you is that they're calling four days out or three days out, wanting a time, and they're just not going to get it. We're, so not, we're I beg to differ because a couple of times last year I called on Saturday at four o'clock. Excuse me, Sunday at four o'clock. And the best tea time I could get was 11.30 or 12. I don't see how that's possible. It, it happened. I mean, it was on days when the course was fully, basically fully sold out on a really nice Sunday. Yeah, but members get an hour. They're, they're no, and I called at four. I started calling at four, twice, three times, maybe. I think and sometimes four. some tournaments go out too. Yep. No, we really don't. We don't really don't uh, don't book tournaments on Saturday and Sunday before eleven o'clock. We don't. But I do know that a uh, unless unless a, unless a ladies uh, club we're noon event is there, uh, you know, has an event or a men's club has an event, then they do they do get a block of time. But but those guys would have played anyway. Or those gals would have played. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'm not talking about those days, but there, twice last year for sure, the mm -hmm. best tea time I could get was sometime between 11:30 and 12. Well, I don't see how that's. I'm not. I'm, no, I'm just. I mean, it's it's not. I, but but just know that from a season pass holder, a member perspective, there's a lot of popularity with playing on a Saturday or Sunday morning. But only mm -hmm. members can have the four o'clock to five o'clock call in privilege. Exactly, a lot of people called. Because I, I mean, on one of them for sure, I didn't get a pickup until almost a quarter after. So, and that's fine. I mean, I, I mean, no, you know, I just found something else to do. But because um, I couldn't do that late 
for whatever reason. So, um, well, and 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 just just to say, um, if if somebody calls me, um, then a member calls me and they are aced out, I always say, "Come out, I will get you." Mm -hmm. I will get them going, which is what I do. Yep. On a Saturday and Sunday morning, that's those are my times. Yeah, but Todd, yeah, exactly, and that's fine. That's cool. But just be aware that it does happen, that there are some days when you just get a mass of season pass holders who call in to try and get tea times on a Sunday or Saturday morning. And, and you get, you get a lot of people looking for tea times. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's one of these signals of the problem that we've got. You've got, if you've got 49 new members, then that's, you know, that's 12 new groups potentially that want to play on a Saturday or Sunday or on a Monday or a Tuesday or something like that. So, I mean, it's just, it's just reminding us that we need to pay attention to things like that happening. And it would be interesting to keep track of, you know, what percentage of the tea times get filled up on between four and five on average, be interesting, even just for a couple of days to figure that out. But it's a good, I mean, it's a good problem, Todd. It's not, it's not, but there's a, it's just a good problem. And it's going to be interesting when we get to June to see this fiscal year to date and prior fiscal year to date numbers. Because I think when we get to June 30th or July 1st, that's when we're going to really get to see what the numbers look like. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. It's a nice problem to have. It is. It's all a good problem to have. So okay. there, there, there needs to be a balance between between what you're offering to your members. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to offer your members a value. Correct. Um, so, so yeah. So that that was that was Eric's and and my conversation this morning about. At what point does, you know, too many, at what point does the number become too many? Exactly. And then the other thing that would be important for you guys, if you, if you get a chance to have this conversation, is how many greens fee rounds do you need to hit in order to, to get the revenue number hit? Boy, oh boy, we're, we're killing it right now. But I mean, you're right. We have, well, you always have to be sensitive to the revenue that's coming in mm -hmm. and there has to be a balance. I mean, if you have 500 members and you're going to have that much, that number less of greens fees that can be accommodated. And, and so, yeah, there has to be a balance between the two. Mm -hmm. And that's why that kind of discussion has to happen. What yeah. number of members is, is the correct number of members? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're jamming until like during season, we're jamming till beyond five o'clock. It's just, mm -hmm. it's crazy. And, and I love it. I love it. But it is crazy. Okay. All right. So thank you very much for the report. Any other questions, Cindy? Um, Gary? No, I, I, I talk around with places that, you know, you can't get reservations or you can, you know, you know when to go or when not to go and, and you work around it. I have no problem. Some friends asked me, they said, should we go to the, should we go to the brunch at Easter at the Ocean House? And then I asked them and they said, it's a madhouse that weekend. Don't bother. You know, come another weekend. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, you 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 just know when to go. The Matunic Oyster Bar, rainy Tuesday afternoons, you know, are the best times to go. Yeah, exactly. The only yeah. issue, difference here is you're paying up front to be able to play, hey. to get a value out of it. And so, if you can't do that, then we need to, then we risk at some point starting to loop, have that number go back down because people just don't get the value out of it. 
Well, you can make the reservations. You know, it's possible. You just have to know, you know, you have to go a little ahead or know when to or show up, you know, certain hours later or something. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, Margaret, I'm not really sure about this question, but do associate and associate plus members have also share that four o'clock time? Yes, they do. They are unlimited. They're unlimited. That's correct. Wow. Okay. So, and maybe that's something that we consider and that's a good point. If the numbers get too big, that could be a potential where the benefit to the full member, full pay yes. is four o'clock and the benefit to the associate and associate plus is that they can pay, they can play anytime, but they start making tea times at five mm -hmm. or at 4.30, something. But it's just for something to consider for the future. If we get into get into an issue where we, we get to that over the tipping point number. But not right now. Right. Good problem to have. Yep. Okay. Um, next on the agenda, the marketing report. So we have been busy letting people know about our the flexibility in memberships. Flexibility meaning they don't have to sign up by the end of March for the season to kick off at April 1st. They, there's flexibility. We've been letting people know about that. We've uh, sent out a, an email with the new rates to 11,000 unique subscribers. Uh, we've also been reminding those season's pass holders whose membership expired uh, in March that it was time for them to renew. We on Facebook have done a number of posts. Uh, we did a series of, of six different posts. Uh, one, and this was back in March, one focused on uh, Women's Histories Month mm -hmm. and talked about uh, Glenna Colette Var. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that she's on the or in the U.S. Golf Hall of Fame, um, and there was also some Facebook posts about memberships. And uh, Jessica said to me that we've it, since January to March we had the the most significant increase in uh, Facebook likes. Uh, we picked up 108 likes and we are currently at 1,486 followers. That's excellent. So, yes, yep, so we are, um, and we will continue to remind people on a monthly basis that their memberships are, are their season's pass um, is coming due. So we'll be doing that now, uh, I think every single month because I think we're getting new members every single month. Mm -hmm. uh, all year long. So we, we'll continue to do that just to remind folks about that. Right. We had 18 new members from Friday, Saturday to Sunday. New. And how many renewals? Um, let's see. Seven. Okay. Uh, 12. Um, 12, 16. Perfect. 16. Yeah. So you know, Todd said there's there's a churn every year. It's usually around ten percent. So it'll be interesting to see uh, to you know keep track of that to see if that remains about the same. I agree. And we'll see that, especially come June, I think, because June was when a lot of people came back up from Florida. Mm -hmm. so you probably had a, a bolus in June. Yeah, one thing we are seeing is some of those season pass holders whose membership is not does not come up until May or June. I think we're are they're already signing up ahead of time. So depending on how many sign up in advance, we may see a, a drop off in the number of memberships 
because people are kind of signing. There may be a bubble where it's higher in the front and then it tapers off because everybody was anxious to sign up again, even though they didn't really have to. So. Good. Excellent. All good news. And actually, the emails, how are they going out? Um, is somebody manually looking at the list and sending yeah, them out? Yeah, so we, each time an email address is captured, it goes into a database. Todd sends over to the Recreation Division the an updated list of new emails, I don't know, every few weeks. And those get added to the list and, and they're coded, whether it's uh, golf or recreation. And we also have a list of those that have asked not to, I guess they've kind of unsubscribed. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have that list also. And uh, I think we'll be reaching out to them just as a reminder to sign up either by phone call or if we see them at the pro shop, just, hey, don't forget you need to renew your membership or your membership's coming due. Okay. Very cool. All right, any other questions on golf course report or marketing report? Gary, Cindy? No. Okay, cool. So next um, agenda item is this National Register of Historic Places, the Shenacoset application. Yeah, so this is something that we discussed back in September of 2019. Uh, Eric met with uh, Jenny Field Schofield, who I think works for the state. Um, she's the National Register and Architectural survey coordinator, he gave her a tour of the facility and they had a lengthy discussion. And I think in summation, she thought that uh, the property would be worthy of being designated uh, on the state register. I'm not sure about the national register and I'm just reading from minutes. Uh, she did say that the application process is lengthy and in most cases, uh, an organization will hire a consultant to complete the task. Typically that costs around $20,000. Uh, the state at that time in 2019 had uh, municipal grant matching funds where the town would have to contribute around $10,000 and uh, the rest of the money would come from the state. In December or November, the uh, board discussed funding of the application for the National Historic Register. And the consensus was to include it in the funding for renovations to the golf course. So in other words, it would be uh, rolled into a CIP. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I did talk to Greg Hanover, who is the new uh, director of public works, because Greg handles most of the CIP projects and there is a list of projects to be completed or on the schedule uh, either at the cart building or at some other place, I think out front uh, landscaping out in front of the building. Well, I call it the front of the building. Everybody calls it the back of the building on the, on the, <laughs> the side of the building that faces the golf course. There you go. Uh, yes. So, uh, so he said that that was, he felt like that would money to pay a consultant to do this would fit under, uh, would fit into a CIP project. So it, it's something we can do, I guess. And let me ask Eric to, provide a little more insight. I guess, you know, my big concern is I, I don't want us to restrict ourselves moving forward with whatever work we propose, uh, I guess, on the golf course. Um, and, and I don't know, I, I don't recall, Eric, if, if that was part of your discussion with her and, and what the answer was. No, that wasn't part of a discussion. 
Okay. So I guess, you know, that's my one concern because every time I mention this to somebody, they're like, oh, well, now you're going to have to jump through a lot more hoops to do any, do any work. So I, you know, I, I'm um, not sure. I'm not sure that we really need to be jumping through more hoops. Uh, and I'm not sure what value being on the National Historic Register or on a historic register, I'm not sure that that drives golfers to the golf course, but I, I could be wrong. I, think I, don't, I don't believe that it would stop us from doing any improvements, say to the cart building or landscaping. I don't, I don't think those are tied together. Okay. If I remember correctly, I think I might have asked her that question. Okay. Uh, the, as I understand, the restriction is uh, unwarranted destruction. So we can't tear the building down or you know cut half of it off or something. But they would, uh, if it's on the if once if it's on the state register, is uh, there are restrictions if if we take money. If we get a grant to uh, do some work, and then there's a uh, well, there's a an easement that goes with it over a period of time. In other words, we can't fool around with it without checking with them first after they after they paid for it. But so far as I know, that's 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 after they we get a grant and they give us money to do something, <clears throat> and that comes with an easement. But otherwise, it's uh, it's uh, no unwarranted destruction, and nobody would. I think uh, Stonington got into trouble because uh, they were knocking down one of the knockdown buildings and do all kind of rearranging for the uh, for their uh, park on the on the river. And I had to go back and forth and and rearrange that. But I don't think we're going to have the money to like knock down buildings or even anything in the <clears throat> in the cards. And as far as the course, you know, we're, we've got an architect and everybody's all on board with maintaining the, the status. So I don't think there's a great, as far as who goes to the course, I don't know, people, the survey said people went to the course for, uh, they played there because it's, uh, why, why do I keep forgetting the guy's name? <laughs> who the hell designed the course? Donald Ross, Donald Ross course. Donald Ross, yeah. Yeah, Donald Ross. And uh, according to the survey, some people said they played it because it was a Donald Ross. So quite a number of them, whether it's true or not, I don't know. But, uh, you know, National Register, people talk about those things. My father used to play golf courses and he said, oh, that's where they had the PGA tournament. There's uh, this one and that and the other. You know, and I don't know whether, he, whether the course was all that special, but it, it, they come with a, you can play golf a lot of places. I'm kind of, uh, one of the things is uh, apparently they do have, they do have someone that will help you out with, uh, with construction, uh, things that are in compliance with the ADA. I'm afraid the town manager took that to mean we could get out of making ADA compliant bathrooms. It's, it's all part of the ADA, this historic, uh, Things that are even eligible it doesn't necessarily have to, be, as far as I can read it, it doesn't have to be on the on the register. But it'd be worth dropping a dime to this guy to see if you know. It's like you could do this and not that, and it might be helpful. Might save us some money. Might 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 make some sense. But Gary, I don't I don't think we want to be in non-compliance just because we're on the National Historic Register. I, no, I think no, the no. right thing I think the right <clears throat> thing to do is to make the building accessible to everybody. Well, and ADA, I, don't, I don't want to use, I don't want to use, well, we're on the National Historic Register, so we don't have to, we don't have to make the building accessible. No, no, no. The, the ADA has standards for, for historic properties. There are certain exceptions, and so I don't think it means you can't, you know, I don't think it applies necessarily to the bathroom. It probably has to do with entrances and things. So I'm not sure, you know, and I don't know. I mean, I'd have to call a guy up and ask him. But it's not, it, it is part of the ADA, the historic uh, uh, allowances. 
and they're part of it's part of the ADA. So it's not it's not an exception to the ADA. It's part of it. So I don't know if it'd be helpful or not, but it should be worth dropping a dime and calling this guy up and saying, "What's it look like?" He said, "Not much for you." <clears throat> Maybe you might want to do this or that. Otherwise, I think uh, you know. I keep thinking this historic register might make the the clubhouse more marketable when it's when the when the uh, when the lease the current lease is up for the clubhouse. It might. Uh, spark some additional interest. Well, the a meeting that I had with Jenny from the state, we were talking about the golf course being on the national or the state register, not just the clubhouse. So it's actually not gonna just be a historic building. It's gonna be the golf course, is it? designated state historical property. Apparently she'd done a course in Truro out on the Cape. And so it has been done before she's done it. So she, she does know this sort of thing. No, I know it's not just a clubhouse, but the, the plaque, the plaque we'd have to pay for would obviously be on the clubhouse. And it would say the golf course, it wouldn't necessarily mean the, the building. <laughs> anyway, uh, council at Bordelon said, you ought to try to move this forward. And I said, ah, you know, I'm tired of this stuff. And then later I was talking <laughs> to Councilor Baumgartner and he says, good idea. He said, Get it started, and then uh, you know I, I, I sent the thing out, and then he picked it up and and started asking questions. He said he's uh, going to put it on the uh, <clears throat> make a <clears throat> try to get it on the agenda at the council. Okay, well, so, so Cindy, any thoughts? I have a few. There's so I look at that clubhouse, and on days I cringe. Um, I, I don't know if, if you go on this historic binge, it's inclusive of both places. Does one have precedent over the other uh, of getting improved? Uh, does one have press? I don't know. I do have some, uh, some concerns. Well, the plaque would be on the clubhouse, and even if it was just a course, nobody would know the difference. But what would have to happen to the clubhouse to earn that plaque? How, well, much, what, how much money would be diverted from the course towards the clubhouse or vice versa? I don't even know if that's the way it goes. Well, what was it? Uh, they thought about 20000 with the state picking up half of it. That was for the right. consultant, you said. To fill right. out the yeah, the consultant, the consultant would fill out the application because it's rather extensive. Yeah. And you have to gather a lot of historical information, which Eric mm -hmm. has done a, an outstanding job of already just on his own because of his personal interest. Um, I, I don't think we would be diverting any money from the course that would go to the clubhouse the projects for the clubhouse go through public works uh, any type of cip projects on the golf course go through parks and recreation so we wouldn't be i wouldn't see us diverting money from from the course to go to the clubhouse okay and you know we there aren't things that we need to do now in order to get the clubhouse on the register. It would be evaluated based on the condition it is now in the history of the building. And, you know, there aren't like, oh, you, there's not gold standards that have to be met in order to be, as far as the condition of the facilities uh, to determine, you know, whether you qualify. It's more the historical nature of the clubhouse or, or the course. 
Eric, are you, Eric, are you uh, documenting the history of the clubhouse also, or just the golf course? It's mostly the golf course, but okay. you know, I've come across articles with pictures of the clubhouse or the inside mm -hmm. of what the clubhouse used to look like. So we have some stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, even if it were just a course, the, the plaque would go on the clubhouse. So nobody would know, you know, it's part of a package. You could easily have the course on the register and, and excluding the clubhouse, but it doesn't, the plaque wouldn't say, Shenacosset golf course, not the clubhouse. <laughs> this wouldn't. In fact, uh, uh, the week of Paul again, it's, it's got one on the front of the door of the National Register of Historic Places. And they had a lot of buildings over there. And I don't know exactly where the historic ends and the, and the new construction begins, but the sign is by the main entrance. And the, So um, I think for me, the, the thing is doing, continuing to do these like little one-off things and, and not to say that this is little and just one-off, but it feels like to me that it, now would be a really good time to go back. And it's been a, what, about 20 years since we last did a strategic plan for the golf course and or the building. And maybe it's time to do another I don't know, five year, 10 year plan. And part of that could be items like National Register of Historic Places, maintaining the Audubon um, designation and doing some of this other stuff. We already have a plan for improvements to the course, but it feels like from, uh, we, it feels like we're missing the kind of that overall arching picture of the, where we want this golf course to be in five years or 10 years. And I'm wondering if it would be worth doing that exercise and, and then potentially having this National Register um, application process come out of that exercise if we deem that that's where we want the golf course to go. We just seem, it feels, and this is just me, it feels like we just kind of hit these one-off, one-off, one-off and then hope to kind of include something together. And I mean, the strategy 20 years old really isn't a strategy anymore. And it, it sh probably should be put to bed. Um, the one that was done one of, a while back. It yeah. occurred to me when I saw the architects, uh, you know, the Donald Ross certified architect plan that Donald Ross this, in fact, I recall asking who the hell is Donald Ross? and then. And I said, hmm, maybe you can put it on the National Register. And then I looked around and found a couple of courses that were on for. Uh, oh, no, absolutely. You know, one, and I said, it, it looks like a, it's, it's a, a possibility. And in history cells, I mean, how many times you see this located in historic whatever? Uh, I st Upton Base in Barnett's Corners, I look at their website, they make uh, stringed instruments. And, and it mm -hmm. says located in historic Barnett's Corners. And ooh, is that the Barnett's Corners I know? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's it's marketing. Yeah, Margaret, the, the shelf life for a strategic plan is, <laughs> you know, it, it's certainly not 15, 16 years ago. Right. Uh, the, you know, the shelf life is probably five to maybe eight years, and then it's time to re time to renew that. I mean, we're we worked on a, a master plan for recreation in 2009 and I put money in the budget to, and I should have probably done this a couple of years ago to put money in the budget to update the, the master plan for the, the entire department. So maybe that could in the end be handled separately from this. But I, I mean, for me, it feels like you know, if we, somebody were to make a blanket statement that said, in five years, this is what we want Shenacosset to be. This is how we want to operate. This is, you know, a few things. I just don't feel like we quite have that right now, um, except for the fact that we've seen the architect's plan. So we know that in five years or less or more, hopefully less, the course is going to be um, 
is going to be updated or refreshed to look like that. And I think that's all something that's something that we all kind of get behind and agree with and are very much so looking forward to seeing. But um, and then we'd have this, but then it just still doesn't feel like we have, to your point, given that the lifespan of a strategic plan, typically five to eight, nine years, feels like we've, we've kind of lost track of that. And, and in that time, we've had several, the world has gone upside down twice, at least. Um, and so, you know, things have changed. The golfing world has changed. A lot of things have changed, and I, I just want to make sure that we're positioning the course to be in a good place to to do all these things, the things that you're talking about, Gary, and everything else um, for the next 15, 20 years, right? That we're doing things now as the stewards of the course to, to make sure that that happens correctly. I kind of feel like we're missing that. The thing that ties all this together. Yeah, Margaret, I think I think you make a good point that we need an we need an overarching plan, and some of the things that we're talking about now would fall under that plan. Right. And and rather than like I think you said cherry picking, you know, picking this and picking that, let's let's have a big plan and decide. Okay, what are our priorities? And I, I would agree. Yep. And more than likely, it'll make sense to pursue the National Register or State Register of Historic Places. But there may be something that we're missing because we're just kind of so focused on these one-offs, just cherry picking. Well, we've had several um, versions of plans for the facilities that have been on five-year CIP plans in public works for the clubhouse the parking lots, the cart building, the maintenance building. And what eventually ends up happening is the first phase gets kicked down the road a year. And then you get to the next year and it gets kicked down another year. And before you know it, your five-year plan and it's 10 years, you've done nothing. And then you might get $50,000. So that's why you can only do a one-off thing because they're only giving you a small piece of what you really need to execute your plan. Right. And that those 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 things are kind of the golf course facilities side of it. Um, and I hear you absolutely agree with you, Eric, on that. I mean, we've all seen the, the punting down the road, but to have that kind of plan to be able to go and say, hey, this is how, this is where we see the golf course in five years. We're not able to do, I mean, and it's not just, you know, redesign the green complex on number four. It's also how we operate. What's the business model look like, you know, different things. I mean, we're going to talk about revenue diversity, junior golf programs, um, and other things going on. And we just kind of, I feel like we need that to tie together. And sometimes with that case, and people understanding what the vision is for the course five years from now, eight years from now, whatever the number is, um, at least we would have that and be able to do it. I just feels like the last time we did an over, or that work was done, I wasn't even involved at that time, um, was 15, 20 years ago. I've been living here 15 years and it was done before I got here. So it's been a while since we've had kind of that cohesive uh, communication of what we want the golf course to be. Unless you have it, Eric, in, the, in that case, I'm good. And it's just because we're only seeing bits and pieces. We just have- no, I think you're referring to the NGF study that happened in yep. 2003. Yep, that we can, we continue to refer to. Well, that, that study was the reason why this board was formed. I get it, but it's just, it's... To apply well, the the findings of the NGF. But I mean, but we all have to, to acknowledge and, and remember 
that uh, the golf course is a special enterprise fund and nothing happens unless we have the money. So we, we only can pay for what we can pay for. Right. And the other stuff that we can't pay for, which is the, the, uh, the capital improvements comes from the general fund. And that's where Eric says is kick down the road, kick down the road, kick down the road. We are fine operationally uh, with what we make in greens fees, cart fees, season passes. Um, but, but we're at the whim of the general fund uh, as far as capital improvements. So there's no planning that we can make. We can make any plan that we want to make, but it's not going to happen unless there's the will of the RTM and the town council to go ahead and pay for it. Well, my, my career at the RTM has been uh, uh, to a certain amount tied up in the former Fitch Middle School and getting out and getting everybody out of uh, William Seeley and into Fitch Mark will, will say, you know, they, they wanted 400,000 and then uh, they got 200,000 and the next year it was 200,000. I think they hit 100,000, you know, it was, it was awful. All right. I mean, I understand, but it just, just having from my experience in business without a strategy or without a, some sort of target that you're going after. I mean, if we're going to say that the golf course is just going to live year to year, has no vision for what it wants to be or what it wants to provide to the community, then then let's just declare that and be done and, and we continue on. But it just feels like we're asking for things like the to investigate registers of historic places and doing all these other things without kind of an overarching strategy for where we want this course to be. Not all of it requires money. I mean, a lot of it can be what we want the course to stand for, what kinds of things were going on. We've just come through an incredibly lucrative year. I can't imagine that last year we, we even with that operationally, we netted out at zero at the end of the year. And if we netted out at zero, then we really didn't have either we're not fully understanding the increasing costs of the operating budget or something's happened um, that, that we're kind of not seeing. But it feels like if we have a really lucrative year, put some safe money away, but there should be potentially some, some funding to be able to do another NGF study or or not even a, a strategic plan for the golf course and other things. And so there's not even a kind of a thought or any visibility into to where that is at this point in time either. Just for the record. But that's okay. I, I you know, we can we can certainly table this. Cindy, you've been pretty quiet. Yeah, I'm quiet. That's all right. No, I mean, I agree with Margaret. We are doing things here and there, and but we've got outside factors that influence influence right. us. And if if we don't have a plan, then we're not going to go anywhere. I agree with Margaret. I think we should try and set up a five year plan at least. I mean, we've got all those plans for redoing the golf course that came out what two three years ago. Everything was nice and organized, year this, year that, everything's there. I mean, I, that's a start off point. Mm -hmm. I still have my copy somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I do too. Or Nicholsworth, everybody uh, on the surveys, they, they speak uh, favorably of the bunkers. And actually it's probably just one bunker set of bunkers that uh, got redone but uh, it has an impression. They don't look at, they look at the good one that we did and forget about the one that we were gonna do and didn't do yet. Yep. Okay. So with that, are we, we're- Margaret? Yes. Is this where I might bring up something that I talked about last fall. 
is kind of unfinished business, I think. Okay. Um, I, I spoke about mosquitoes. And I would like entered into the record tonight that uh, I talked to a Joe Blanchard from the Ledge Light Health District. And he told me what they do. They do go out into the community, but not, they wouldn't go out for the golf course, but they would go out into individual people's homes, areas, and they would use a larvicide to take care of the mosquitoes in a particular area in somebody's yard. And at that point, Eric said that he would consider doing something like that. Don't let me put words in your mouth, Eric, but I think that's what you said. Now, I did read over this Shinnecasset Best Management Practices. Um, I believe it's based on some Connecticut um, rules, regulations. They spend very little time on mosquitoes. And the only mosquitoes they talked about were those from wetlands on the golf course per se. Where our mosquitoes are coming from is not in the actual golf course, it's in a budding lands. So I don't know if you have to hire somebody from the outside to use larvicide behind number eight, or if Eric can do it, I don't know. I mean, I just would like really to see something happen here. I spoke with the superintendent at Black Hall Country Club. They have pretty big mosquito problems. He uses a propane machine called a mosquito magnet sends out pheromones and sucks the mosquitoes into the trap. Problem with those is that you actually them. So it kind of brings them out of where they are. So you gotta locate the machine in a good spot, but you could technically make the problem worse. <laughs> and then, um, but I'm gonna, I don't think he's using them. I'm going to go over to the club and uh, at least check it out and see how it works. And maybe he'll let me borrow one if they're not using them, but I'm not sure on that yet. And then I'm in the process of seeing if there's some vendor that sells mosquito dunks. And if I can find a supplier, then we can put some of the larvicide dunks in the wetlands behind the tea. According to Blanchard, he said they're available in it at any hardware store. I never looked, but that's what he yeah. told me. Neither have I. So um, you might want to contact him, though. I mean, he's familiar with it, with the mosquito problems. That's his area for the town. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So back to the National Register of Historic Places, Mark, where, we, where did we end up with that? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay. So I think we still need probably some further discussion. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if we've got two town councilors that are going to continue to bring it up we probably should have a position in place. Yes. Well, I, I, I think would, uh, I would agree. Bongard has said he's uh, he, he, he he initiated a referral on it, so we'll see what happens, what, where that goes. Where would that referral have gone? Uh, it's to the to the to the council. I don't know how they handle it. it goes over there. And, yeah, I think it would go course, to the council, and then it would filter down to uh, probably the Parks and Rec Commission. Okay. And then they would kick it down to the Golf Advisory Board and then it would work its way back up. Okay. So we've got a little bit of time to prepare for that. Yeah, I don't think it's gonna happen. They're busy with the budget right now, so. Yeah. Oh, uh, tonight there were uh, 
inquiring about uh, uh, the registrar of voters and moving them into the former Fitch Middle School, the space there. And uh, that, that came up and, they, and apparently it's not, not in their budget, but they're, they're going to make plans and preparations to make space for them in the former Fitch Middle School. So that means a classroom or something. So, so things are a uh, little more lights coming on in the hallways and little progress there. Who knows, maybe get all the way to the front of the building, you know, for parks, maybe parks and around. Someday, maybe. Someday. <laughs> okay. Maybe we table that again, unfinished business into next month's. Okay. All right. New business, revenue diversity. So a few years back, we came up with a list of discussion topics, one each uh, for the six or seven meetings that we have. And for the April meeting, revenue diversity was yes. selected. So I put that on the, on the agenda. Okay. So I think we had um, some initial discussions. I think that balance between season pass holders and greens fee certainly falls into this um, conversation. Todd, I'm assuming that um, charity tournaments are coming back into onto schedules this year. They're starting to, but but not to the level that we we have been expecting. Probably we're at uh, less than fifty percent, something like thirty five percent, I think. Okay. So I mean, people are so. I mean, there, there was a new directive from the CSGA that, that expanded the ability of golf courses to, according to the, their recommendations, um, to allow for uh, greater gatherings and, and not solo riding and, and uh, you know, two people on a cart kind of thing. Um, but <clears throat> I think there is still among the public uh, uh, certain reluctance um, to to just jump all in uh, at this point uh, with participation. And so we're seeing that as far as the booking goes. Okay. Other, um, let's see, other sources of revenue that come into the course, really not much, right? So we've never talked about other uses of the golf course beyond just golf, right? I think conversations about foot golf came up way back in the past, things along those lines. But I haven't heard any discussion of that recently. At, at times of the year, we have a vibrant nighttime golf yeah. going on. Yes, we do. <laughs> the problem is they're not paying us, so it's not really revenue. <laughs> and maybe, I mean, that's something to think about. The other, the other, so that does bring up one other thing, and that is that we do have, especially as we get into the summer hours, I mean, there's still nine holes worth of golf that can be played after 6 p.m. at night. And so are we losing out on revenue by closing the pro shop at six instead of, say, at seven? 
Well, we've, we've experimented with that over the past years. Um, I think it was like maybe 10, 12 years ago <clears throat> where we, we kept the, the pro shop open till seven and, and we would get maybe one, two, three people um, come out uh, for nine holes. Um, It, it wasn't significant enough for for um, as far as you know the the golf committee is, was concerned to go ahead and and extend that extra hour. It just really wasn't. I mean, it really didn't make a a, a blip. Was there any advertisement about it? Any advertisement? Well, yes, of course we we. We have our 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 rate schedule advertised, and and our twilight rate is five o'clock, and we have a really good five o'clock um, kind of I wouldn't say a rush, but I would say quite a few people come out at, at the five o'clock hour um, to to play, and um, yeah, so yeah, we do that, and uh, and we get some good action. Five o'clock to like five twenty, five thirty, and then it drops just drops off. Okay. Mark, I think, yeah, we put this on, but I don't know that we have much to discuss at the moment. Okay. Well, we could look at perhaps changing the yep. topic uh, moving forward. Exactly. Okay. Can I ask you a question here? Um, when the um, clubhouse has a wedding and they're using the grassed areas outside, does the golf course get a piece of that? Monetarily? No. Okay. I know in the past you haven't really wanted to um, encourage this kind of thing because of the parking issues. Right. Yeah, it happens pretty infrequently. Yeah. Maybe once a year or, or even less. Yeah, it's less than that. We've really only granted one or two special uses for weddings in the past. Yeah, there was one last summer mm -hmm. and one the summer before. Yeah. And and the one the last year was, um, was a, a nod to the problem with COVID where they really had to be outside and so we gave them that option and it was more a COVID kind of, uh, you know, concession. Well, they ended up getting married just off the course, right? So behind the 17th. Or well, they had, they had a small tent just outside yep. where we staged the, uh, the, the back strand of carts mm -hmm. by the uh, cart barn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It was, be, it was because of COVID because because the, the, the party could not be accommodated inside. So that's why um, Mark and, and Eric, um, you know, granted that kind of thing. Okay. Nope. So thank you for that. So the next one is junior golf program discussion. Next item. Okay, so I mean, some, some background. I mean, um, I, I, Casey and I, every year we run a junior golf program. Um, we, we always have during the summertime uh, in the last 10 years or so, um, 
we have partnered with the department and, uh, and Casey and I do a, a beginner camp and a, an advanced camp. Um, we, Casey and I do not take any fees. So, so any revenue that's generated goes to the, um, the department. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, and, and we're, and we're so, we're so good with that because Casey and I, as golf professionals, we're all about growing the game and encouraging uh, kids to, to, you know, get into the game because that's our future. And that's, you know, that's our livelihood, you know, honest, honestly. <clears throat> um, but the thing about it is it, it's, it's all a matter of participation. I mean, when back in 90, 98 and 2000, when Tiger just came on, um, when we were running our, our junior camps, we had almost 30 kids come out, which is a lot. That is a lot. Um, and so it, it just so happened that, that, um, that a friend of mine who was between jobs, uh, Ryan Quinn, um, PJ professional, um, he said, hey, I'm, I'll help out, whatever. So, um, so, so we were able to handle that, uh, that surge in participation because uh, for safety and for effectiveness, I mean, we, the, the ideal, as far as the PGA is concerned, uh, is like a six to one uh, student to um, um, pro ratio. And so we can only handle as much as Casey and I can handle. So, so when we run programs for the department, um, it's, it's a maximum of 12. Now, in the last several years, we get four kids, five kids or whatever. So we would love to see uh, an increase in participation. That, that's the thing. We have equipment. The kids, frankly, the kids have equipment. Their, their parents, if they're, if they're going to enroll them into um, a junior golf um, camp, the kids have equipment, but we also have equipment on the chance that the kid, uh, the, 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 the youngster does not have equipment. We do have equipment. We have balls, we have the areas, and we have the wherewithal to, to, to handle them. Um, so, I mean. Okay, so. Um, like, and, and as, as far as marketing goes, um, guys, the uh, I mean the objective for the for the program is to, is to grow the game as I said, um, but uh, I mean the marketing really is the department handles the marketing. Jess, in in the in the in the department in, in Park and Rec, does a great job uh, with promoting our our stuff. We're in the Discover um, pan, uh, quarterly. Uh, for for the for the program, uh, I think that it would be great for for me and for Casey <clears throat> if if the men's and ladies clubs are are willing to go ahead and and participate in helping us grow the game. I mean, if you have an idea about how to get the kids out of their you know virtual headset or their their game you know, Game Boy, whatever, and, and come out and, and, and play the game. I want to have that discussion with you um, because I think that's a key. Uh, we, have, we, have the, we have the resources, we have um, the, prof the professional uh, participation with Casey and me, as we always have every year. Um, but we need to get the kids out on to, you know, the, the golf course and, and into the program because we, we offer every chance 
every chance for them to come out and and participate it's hard and uh, i'd love to talk sit down with margaret with you and with brad and and whomever else you think that that we can do uh to 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 kind of scheme uh, a way to to get the kids more involved we've even like four, four or five years ago uh, we reached out to uh, Glenn Graham, who is the, the coach for uh, for Fitch. And um, we wanted to do, to do a reach out to the middle school to kind of get the kids to kind of be thinking about um, uh, golf and, and coming out and participating and, and, and letting them know about the beginner camps or whatever. It didn't move the, the needle at all. And so that's the issue. Um, that's not just an issue with, with us, with Shenikasa. That's an issue, um, uh, you know, across, across our country. It's just hard to get the kids out to participate. And so yeah. I, 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 love, I love the, we're all about inclusion. We're all about, about uh, getting kids out there uh, we we have an in, total interest in, in growing the game because because their participation is is the future of our game um, and our livelihood and the golf course's livelihood and so so yeah so I, I think that that we really need to sit down and and maybe plot out maybe some ways that we can go ahead and get that thing done. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I mean, that that's very helpful. Um, my one suggestion is um, maybe do the start in the spring doing it when the kids are still in school and you have a captive audience to market to, to be able to get them out. Yeah, we, we, we yeah, we, yeah, we, we've tried that. We have. Um, you know the the after school uh, thing is is like four thirty to six, and that we but tried I'm, that a couple of years and that. But on a Saturday afternoon, or on a you know, um, get them out there somewhere, you know, take over the field for a Saturday afternoon. Margaret, I love to talk to you about it. Okay. It just feels like, I mean, while you've got them, like you've got a captive audience that you can actually market to. If you let the school get out and you let kids scatter, that it's it's just not going to, you're not going to be able to recapture them. Well, during during the week, during the week, it's, it's shown to be after a, two or three years of doing that, during the week, it's, it's it just, when they're in school, it's, you know, course there's the, the complication with COVID obviously but it's it's problematic and you and you raise the idea of Saturday or Sunday well we could certainly try I mean you know we've always focused on when school is out mm -hmm. uh, because we know that they're they're out and we uh, you know during the summertime we focus on like 9 to 11 where it's not so hot and um and and there have been years that we've had great great participation like with the tiger bounce um but lately no it, it's it's following the trend that that uh that golf is experiencing uh which is a, a kind of a decline but with the covid there there has been there has been, thankfully, a bounce up. We have more junior members than we ever have last year and this year. Yeah, and, and that's my whole point around going back to the strategy thing. The world changes, and so if we don't adapt and we don't start looking at how we can take advantage of things that maybe don't cost so much money, it would... Um... Well, we don't charge anything. Yeah, you do. You charge ninety nine dollars for residents, one hundred nineteen for non residents for the beginner program. 
Well, Casey, well, well, okay, so. And you charge 129 and 149. No, Casey and I don't charge ask. anything. Yeah, but the kids are being charged. We can only make available the program to the kids. I don't know, I'm just, yeah. Okay, and, and so we're there and we're willing. Mm -hmm. And so we're wanting. And that's that's all as far as the the professional staff at Shinnecasset is concerned, that's all we can do. Okay. Yeah, so I think we would be happy to get some people and, and help you think through ways to get younger kids in particular, maybe little seven and eight. I mean, you just had drive, chip and putt on the weekend. You know, maybe it's organizing programs around something like that with the younger ones. I mean, they start at seven years old for them. So maybe we need to be targeting a little, just so, so maybe there's people out there with some fresh ideas who could help you guys out for sure. And we can work towards pulling together a, a, a little brainstorming or strategizing session with you to help. Sounds great. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that though, for the background. I did not, I wasn't aware of most of that. All right. Cindy, any questions? Gary? No, no, not on that. All right. Uh, next on the agenda, the Shenacosset Best Management Practices Manual. Yeah, I'm going to so, turn this over to Eric. Sorry, Eric. No problem. We're just, I noticed we're pretty short on time, so I'll try to make this brief. Um, in 2017, the National Association of Golf Course Superintendents, GCSAA, uh, set out a goal of having all 50 states have a published best management practices guide by 2020. So when I was president of the Connecticut Association of Golf Course Superintendents, our local chapter, we secured grant money uh, to start that process. So we enlisted help from the University of Connecticut, University of Massachusetts, their doctors, um, you know, several other specialists in the New England area. Initially, it was going to be a New England best management guides practices with all six states working together with people from all the universities. But that didn't work out. So we did most of the work in Connecticut first. So we ended up just going on our own at some point and we did reach the goal by 2020. Last year, we, Connecticut superintendents, published the state guide for best management practices for golf courses. So it's a comprehensive document. There's 12 sections. Um, I don't know if you guys read through it, but basically it, it's kind of like a roadmap to maintaining a golf course in Connecticut uh, using the best practices we can to protect the environment. Okay. And do things science based uh, with research that backs what we do. So once the Connecticut guide was published, now there's a template online where each course can go in and customize the document to their mm -hmm. own course. So uh, that's what I've done. Okay. And that's what you guys got emailed nice. to you. It's a heavy read. I'm sure you guys <laughs> didn't go through the whole thing, but um, Eric, that's yes. Eric, um, I did scan it. Uh, I liked the table of contents, but there were no page numbers. Took a very long time to flip through to find anything about mosquitoes or ticks. Um, I would suggest, if possible, that you get the pages numbered. Yeah, so I don't think I can do that because it got. Like I said, the template from the Connecticut one was put on there. Yeah. Oh, my table of contents has page numbers on it. The yeah, one that came to pages don't have page numbers on it. And, and your table of contents does hyperlink to the pages. So that's very helpful. Yeah. Oh, maybe that's why they're numbered then. But yeah, the pages aren't numbered. Yeah. 
I don't know why that is. That's my only comment <laughs> on the on that. No, it, it's it's very thorough. There, there's no doubt about that. Very thorough. Yeah, we ended up uh, the Connecticut superintendents hired a uh, sustainable. I don't know what they actually call themselves. We we hired a consultant to help us put it all together after we had a lot of the individual chapters written. So yeah, yeah it, it's it's a very professional document. Yes, it is. There's actually a forward by Joe LaCava in there, Tiger's Caddy. There's yes. okay. uh, some other stuff in there, but yeah, it's fairly comprehensive, but you know, something that if anybody wonders what we do at Shenacost, you know, a lot of the stuff we were doing already, we were certified with the Audubon Society since 2005. Yep. So it was really just putting it down into one comprehensive document in writing what we do, how we do it. And do you have check, have you created checklists and uh, guides that your your team uses that's based off of this or is there- I went through and customized this document to what we do. So like some of the stuff that was in this document, like for instance, stuff about irrigating with wells and where your well heads are, we don't have wells. Right. So those are taken out. So I went through each chapter and removed stuff, added some stuff. Mm -hmm. put in some of our pictures versus other people's pictures and it's a living document too so you know like if Cindy wants to see more mosquitoes in there I can go back in there and you know add a line about what we do for mosquito control you know right now that would be more generally covered in the IPM section integrated pest management which would you know dealing with any pest this is the checklist that you run down you know, before you decide to say use a pesticide or you use something else. I did see that list. You read a lot then. I did. I tell you, I, I went through yeah. looking for answers to a few questions. No, I think this is a great document. I would also potentially suggest um putting a copy of it up on the shenny website somewhere yeah that's a great idea margaret so that people can see see yeah. what you're doing and what you're thinking through yeah because it really i mean just kind of my first glance through it i went real fast um but I, there's just a lot of good information in there in particular when it comes to talking about the vegetation and the plants and the mm -hmm. The stormwater, I know we've had discussions about stormwater in the past, um, especially as it relates to some of the neighbors. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good resource. Very good. Thank you very much. For that, was a, that was a nice picture, the pollination garden. Yes. Pink cosmos, that was really pretty. And you got Peg in there. So yeah, no, it's all good. So yes, Eric, we looked at it briefly. Good work. Okay. Phew. Margaret. Cindy. Can I have a request for the next meeting? Uh, sure. I would like to see listed I, I, in writing the CIP monies. I, I mean, we're way out of whack because it's been a couple of years now. But I, I'd like to see what is there and where we stand with it all. Yep. In writing, I'd like to see that. Cindy, I can do that easily. I, I can tell you that we were told, department heads were told this year uh, not to put any CIP projects in the FYE 22 budget unless it was classified as essential. So everything that we had planned, well, actually what had been planned for FYE 21 was kicked back to FYE 22 mm -hmm. and now has been kicked back to FYE 23. So we're at this point will be two years behind where we hoped we would be. 
but I, I can, the, the, the schedule has not changed other than the dates, the implementation yeah. dates, but I can, I can certainly share that with everybody at the next meeting. Good, thank you. Notes. All right. Any other topics for discussion? Uh, Margaret, I have one quick one. Um, getting a few more board members. Has the men's club and women's club done any promoting, reaching out? Not actively, um, but we will. It, it has. It came up this week again. Just so you know, in discussions with. Um, with the men's club. So we do know that we need to grab three three new members, one of whom I think has to be a non-resident, right? Uh, let me check my make sure I've got that we've got that right as we go ahead and plan this. Right. That would be the Brian McCallum replacement. Yep. Yeah, so there's one non-resident and two resident openings on the gab currently. Yep. We're gonna we're gonna start working on that in earnest now. Okay. Yeah, and we're hoping to find a little diversity here and thought um, some people out maybe outside the men's and women's club. Um, and maybe like Brian was somebody from the industry that's outside the scope of Shanna Cossett just to get some kind of different perspectives onto the golf advisory board. I think that'd be a great idea. Okay. Right, I, I can reach out to uh, someone like Chris Hedden, who's the teaching professional at, uh, at Elm Ridge. He might be interested in, in helping us out. Or he might know some people who, who would be good candidates. So, yeah, yeah. That'd be great. Yeah, you might know some people. Okay. So with that, can we get a motion to adjourn? So moved. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank Sorry. you. Good night. Good night.